like to start out by uh, thanking for organizers for invitation. So it's great to be back here at KTP and also for uh, arranging a special double, double feature this morning. So it was a bit of a surprise for both myself and Julia. So it's good that we looked at the program ahead of time and did not arrive the day before our talks. So, um, and um, what we will be talking about today is um, uh, uh, kind of our efforts uh, towards building scalable quantum machines using uh, individual atoms um, and exciting them into Rydberg states. So this uh, subject has been already broached and discussed yesterday in a very nice talk uh, uh, by Manuel. So what I'll do, I'll briefly review key ingredients of this approach and um, we'll talk about some of our uh, recent efforts. So there are a few he things uh, here mentioned. So in particular in my talk, I will uh, focus on two examples of our recent work. One is application of this um, uh, method to accelerating quantum optimization. So that's actually the topic of the NISC research, which has not been yet mentioned in this conference. And then I will talk about our efforts to kind of beyond, go beyond the NISC um, and in particular talk about this reconfigurable quantum processing architecture. So uh, in our approach, we build quantum systems starting from individual atoms and trapping them in uh, optical uh, tweezers. And uh, uh, we uh, typically start now with, you know, hundreds, actually right now even thousands of, of tweezers and uh, try to grab these um, atoms. So it focus tweezers very tightly such that, you know, each uh, tweezer contains at most one atom. And um, typically when we load uh, these atoms, uh, what you see is that there are some imperfections in this array. and to get rid of these imperfections, what we literally do, <clears throat> we basically take a picture of atoms, figure out which traps are full and which are empty, and then rearrange uh, the rest um, uh, in the desired uh, configuration, for example, in this case, by removing the traps and just moving the atoms. So this approach, as you can uh, recognize from this slide, has been actually uh, pioneered by uh, several remarkable people, including Manuel, and you know, the slide is a is a testament to that, you know, because he had used the same slide. So basically, with this approach, we have um, um, uh, we create uh, arrays of atoms, uh, typically spaced by a couple of uh, micrometers. So at this point, the atoms don't tunnel; they don't interact. The system is completely classical, and to engineer interaction, we excite them into states with large principal quantum number, the so-called Rydberg states. And uh, this effort uh, has been now going on for a few years. As I said, many people contributed to that. Manuel, Hannes, uh, a remarkable group of uh, students and postdocs. And this is a collaboration uh, between my group, a group of Markus Greiner, and a group of Vlad Vuletic at MIT. So I'll say maybe a few words, a little bit about Rydberg interaction. So we like Rydberg interactions because they have long lifetime and strong interactions. So for example, for n equals 100, the wonder while interaction is 14 orders of magnitude stronger than uh, uh, that between the ground state atoms. 14 orders of magnitude is a large number, and we can, you know, make a good use of that. So one specific way how we use it is the idea of Rydberg blockade, and it can be understood as follows. So if two atoms are sitting very far away, and you excite them resonantly, they will just undergo independent radio oscillations. <laughs> but if you bring them close together, what will happen at some point, the uh, uh, the interaction will take over. And then if you still try to excite them resonantly, at this point you will be able to excite one atom or another, but never both. And uh, this is an effect known as a Rydberg blockade. So it basically says that simultaneous excitation will be blocked at distances smaller than the so-called blockade radius. And actually we like to use this effect very much to entangle atoms, to do quantum gates, to perform you know, quantum manipulation. The reason is is that you know, if you excite atoms under this Rydberg blockade, this uh, manipulation is insensitive to motion and exact position of the atoms. So if the atoms move a little bit, you know, it does not matter, all right? And, uh, and uh, uh, it avoids a lot of other kind of effects like, such as light, strong forces and, and, and so on. So I should say that this idea, uh, you know, is, has been actually the result of like my very first conversation with Peter, you know, uh, Zoller. So I think Peter is not here yet, but you know, oh, here it is. Oh, yes. Okay, great. This is so sorry. So sorry. So, uh, and, um, you know, it kind of had a profound effect on uh, 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 certainly kind of my work in this field and, you know, the work of many others. 
Uh, we'll return to that later on. So, in short, uh, uh, what we will be doing is we will start with a random uh, array of atoms and assemble them in desired configurations, subject them to uh, pulses, you know, sometimes changing internal hyperfine states, sometimes exciting them to Rydberg states, and then just make a projective measurement uh, in the top at the end. And you can use this approach for many different uh, kind of modalities and many different uh, um, uh, kind of configurations. One of the uh, particularly useful uh, um, uh, modality is this idea of programmable quantum simulator, which actually is literally implementation of the original uh, uh, vision of, of, of Feynman. Uh, and uh, kind of to understand, you know, uh, how it works, in a simple example here, we can consider one dimensional chain of atoms with equal uh, spacing. And uh, uh, this is a Hamiltonian describing this a chain. So it has terms like uh, Rabi oscillations. It has term proportional to the detuning. It's actually a chemical potential. It has also interaction term. So to understand what type of physics is accessible, let's consider uh, a ground phase diagram, uh, a ground state phase diagram of this um, uh, Hamiltonian and parameterize it with two uh, numbers. One is detuning in, in the units of this Rabi frequency and another one is the interaction range. So if there is no interaction, then this detuning determines, you know, the ground state. So if detuning is negative, then all atoms uh, should be uh, 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 in the ground states. But if the detuning is positive, you would like to have n equals 1. So it means all atoms should be in the Rydberg state. But a state like this is clearly incompatible even with short-range blockade. So if the nearest neighbor are blockaded, then at most, you will be able to excite half of the atoms and you will excite every other atom. So the state, you know, uh, breaks the two uh, symmetry. It's anti-ferromagnetic state. And if you increase the range of interactions, then, you know, you will create a Z3, uh, uh, this kind of state up, down, down, up, down, down, and so on. And, and then this continues. And we can explore this phase diagram uh, uh, very easily by just starting you know, with atoms all in the ground state and then just trying to adiabatically change the detuning to enter all of these different states. And this is actually some of the very first uh, experiments we have done. So here, for example, what you see is an emergence of this, you know, up, down, up, down, anti-ferromagnetic state. So it's the nearest, here on the nearest neighbors are located. So we'll bring the atoms closer together and then not only first, but also second neighbor is blockaded. So you create this state up, down, down, up, down, down, etc. And, you know, uh, and this uh, continues. So here in this example, what you see by simply, in this case, just changing the spacing between atoms, we can actually basically kind of explore different uh, types of orderings, different types of phase um, uh, transitions, different types of symmetry break. So uh, uh, right now, uh, uh, or let's say for last, two years in our lab, we have been um, uh, 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 using, we have been running what we call generation two of atom array uh, apparatus. Um, so it's a, uh, in this uh, experiments, we control two dimensional systems. So the, these uh, two dimensional systems are generated by this element called special light modulator, which is basically a computer generated hologram. And so you can create, for example, a hologram which, you know, if you sort of uh, uh, focus properly, then creates a two-dimensional uh, array of traps, like what, uh, what is shown here. And uh, you can basically create any uh, possible arrangement of, of the traps. Uh, the only problem with this SLMs is that they're slow. So to actually move atoms around, to sort of atom around, we use two crossed acoustic optic deflectors. So these are the devices where you send in the basically microwave tone and then you can deflect it, uh, uh, you know, light deflected by the beam. It's a device which is used in the supermarket barcode scanners, you know, or at least was used in the past. So we use two of them to basically move atoms between the rows and the columns. And, you know, so this is all computer controlled. And one last thing I should kind of mention is that <clears throat> the, it's actually a historical picture. Uh, so uh, just as we were completing this generation to upgrade, uh, 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 pandemic came, and uh, this was the last day when you know we were allowed in the lab all together. So you see some you know happy but tired faces. So you know it means that you know situation developed successfully. So but you know what it really happened there is that basically you know this remarkable group of people, including Julia, I should say, that they were able to in a week, using a week lead time 
convert this experiment from uh, kind of conventional atomic physics experiment into uh, a server. We were allowed to run servers, and that's uh, kind of why this experiment never stopped. In fact, most of the data I will show have been taken uh, uh, remotely. So I should say that we are now completing the third generation upgrade. Uh, and uh, fingers crossed that, you know, there is no such a moment, you know. Uh, in time, and we'll talk a little bit maybe what will happen with this first generation upgrade, uh, maybe Julie in particular. Then. So, uh, so, but basically in the second generation, we were able to create uh, basically an arbitrary arrangements in, in 2D these are these various lattices. We can also create arbitrary patterns, for example, here randomly generated uh, filling of like um, of square lattice. Uh, um, uh, so this is the, um, the pattern we would like to create, you know, we program it, we press the button, and here is an atomic uh, uh, picture. So basically, uh, we typically uh, 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 field around 600 uh, traps uh, with some probability, but then after sorting, we could end up with about, you know, 300 sorted atoms, and each trap is filled with a little higher uh, than 99% probability. So, uh, okay, what can we do with this uh, kind of system? Let's just see if we can explore analogous, uh, some analog analogs of what we have studied in 1D. So, for example, uh, here is a, a, a square lattice, and we arrange uh, for the Rydberg blockade to just, you know, block the nearest neighbors here. And so, and then what we do, we do this adiabatic sweep, and, you know, once in a while we see a picture like this. So, what you see is here is a basically completely anti-ferromagnetically ordered system. Uh, uh, across the entire array. Admittedly, this is not what you see on every shot. So often you see def defects, you know, chunks of, of lattice order. So we need to characterize it uh, in different ways. So one of them is to look at the density-density correlation function. And this really shows this anti-ferromagnetic up-down, up-down, up-down uh, ordering spread across the entire lattice. We can also look at system microscopically. We can ask, for example, what's the probability that, you know, certain states, you know, occur, um, you know, after several measurements. And actually, it turns out that the state like this and the state uh, which is complementary, basically shifted by one lattice site, actually, even though they don't occur that often, they're still the most probable of all. And you can actually, this uh, kind of probability, you can see how it scales. It actually scales as 0.97 to the power of n. That means that during the entire evolution, Time, there is a 3% you know, error in quotes, which actually includes everything, preparation, adiabatic following, quantum fluctuations, you know, and this is the kinds of stuff that we can do. So one last thing I should say is that, you know, you could say, well, you know, these uh, uh, images here, you know, this and this are completely classical. How do you know that anything quantum is going on? So in order to do that, what we could do is we could actually utilize uh, dynamics, we could basically go across the phase transition with different speeds and literally watch how correlations grow. And this growth of correlations is actually described, in this case, it should, should be universal, you know, because it's a second order phase transition. Uh, and uh, it should be described by just, you know, two numbers, which are critical exponents. And actually by watching this growth and using these ideas of universality, we can explore the kind of scaling collapse to extract these uh, exponents. And actually, the exponents correspond to um, quantum Ising uh, phase transition in 2 plus 1 uh, dimension. And these exponents are different, for example, for classical transitions, for 1D. So this is how we can actually really, uh, you know, both benchmark, but also explore, you know, the nature of phase transition is actually a first time this transition is a textbook transition, but it's the first time it was actually experimentally observed. Okay, so with all of these tools, uh, the last uh, two and a half years, we actually had a lot of fun. And um, uh, we explored a wide variety of different uh, things. So for example, uh, we explored uh, a bunch of different phases in 2D. Uh, we explored uh, non-equilibrium dynamics by pushing system far away from equilibrium, you know, but doing it in a kind of responsible way. We actually really made some, you know, small discoveries. So for example, many body scars already were mentioned couple of times, and I'll talk briefly about it at the end of my talk. So Julia will focus on this uh, um, uh, experiment in which we created and probed the topological spin liquids for the first time, so it's actually been quite exciting. Um, and uh, I will talk a little bit about these uh, two uh, topics, accelerating combinatorial optimization and also 
our efforts towards universal programmability quantum error correction by using dynamical um, architecture. I should say also is that we have now more than one machine in town. So across the river and our startup company, Quera Computing, they also build a machine very similar to what I've uh, shown. And actually this machine will be available through AWS cloud, I think in, in a month or two. So actually you will be able, if you're interested, you can be able to log in and play with them. So, uh, okay, so I'll focus now on this uh, topic of combinatorial optimization, but you know, maybe this is in case uh, anyone has questions, you know, about kind of the basics of the approach, I would be happy to uh, to answer. I'm curious about the technical details of readout. Do you have to do this thing where you blow an atom out of the trap and then it fluoresces? Being on the state? Yeah, so uh, the way how we, you know, how we do the readout is uh, it is destructive. So what we do, we indeed, we push the atoms in a state dependent way. We, we push one state away. It could be a Rydberg state or some hyperfine state and then just readout the, the, the other state. So um, uh, this is, gives the highest fidelity, you know. Uh, once you do readout with hyperfine state, this in principle is not necessary. You could do it while, uh, you know, preserving it, but, you know, this is not what we have done so far, yeah. I, I may have missed this. Um, did you say what your shot rate was and how long it takes to sort of rearrange the atoms back into the trap after doing one of these measurements? Sorry, what is what? Is what? Uh, the, the time it takes, right, the time to sort of prepare um, your array and then, you know, run a simulation. Yeah, so, yeah, so the, yeah, the rep, rep, you know, so basically uh, we have uh, the entire cycle. Mm -hmm. Uh, was up to now, it's about three cycles per second. Mm -hmm. And this actually is a, is a subject of the upgrade. Okay. Uh, and I think in the current okay. upgrade, I, mean, I don't know if I can say, right. but it's we already have like more than 10 shots per second. So it's about 100. Thank you. Um, millisecond cycle. Okay. So let me talk about this combinatorial optimization. So this actually is one, you know, topic which, you know, I view as a, like a, an opportunity for the NISC uh, machines is to start exploring, uh, you know, if there are some quantum algorithms which are amenable to a speed up. And uh, one uh, particular the topic which is, you know, potentially very exciting involves uh, trying to solve uh, combinatorial optimization uh, problems faster than the classical machines. So uh, one example of combinatorial optimization problem, uh, which is actually known to be very hard, is something which is called maximum independent set. So in this maximum independent set, uh, uh, it's a very simple problem is the following. So you're given a graph in which you have some vertices and these vertices are connected by edges. And uh, the, the problem is to basically color the, the, the vertices, but you cannot color two vertices which are connected by edge. And so the problem is simply to find the largest number of, uh, uh, of vertices which you can color. So uh, the example shown here uh, is the, uh, this MIS problem on something which is called unit disk graph. So basically here, you know, all vertices which are uh, within certain distance are connected uh, by, by the edge. So this kind of uh, picture should remind you something. So now people started traveling again. So on the back cover of your airline magazine, you know, pictures look very similar. And, um, uh, and what it means really is that this problem has actually some real world applications, you know, for designing networks and so on. Yet, this is an example of NP uh, complete problem. So fa solving it exactly, uh, even on this unit disk grab, uh, uh, graphs is known to be NP hard. So at the same time, now, if you followed my talk up to now, then uh, what uh, you will notice is that this problem is intrinsically connected to this Rydberg blockade. So in Rydberg blockade, you know, what we'd like to do, we'd like to excite atoms in the Rydberg state, but we cannot excite atoms which are um, uh, within this blockade radius. So, and actually mathematically what it means is that basically the cost function for this problem, which you can, you know, write down, at least the classical part is actually a classic response to a classical part of the, of the Rydberg blockade Hamiltonian. 
And so this is something that actually Hannes uh, first uh, noticed and actually this really provides us with an opportunity to try to use our approach to basically solve this problem, to try to solve this problem and try to see if this solution is, you know, better, anyway better than, for example, the, the classical solves. So uh, this is based on many prior work ideas, you know, there's adiabatic algorithms have been introduced already more than 20 years ago. Uh, there has been a lot of work, of course, on things like quantum annealing, of the wave, you know, and then there are all of these kind of classes of algorithms approximate quantum optimization and, 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 and so on. So there is actually a lot of theoretical activity in this area, but most of this activity is focused on the shallow circuits, you know, because they are amenable to theoretical analysis. Our approach is to try to go beyond these shallow circuits and by using this very efficient encoding, by using this correspondence between blockade and this MIS problem. So specifically what we'll do is we'll create uh, uh, an atom array where basically each atom will represent the vertex in the graph and then we'll arrange for the Rydberg blockade uh, such that it corresponds to this D, to this kind of unit uh, in this unit D's graph, so for this uh, connectivity. And then what we'll do is we'll try to basically, you know, design the excitation uh, sequence, pulse sequence, to try to basically excite as many atoms as possible subject to this locate constraint. And, you know, if everything would be perfect, this should give us the solution to this MIS problem. So this would be this quantum evolution. So uh, in what follows, I'll focus just on one class of evolutions. And this will be kind of variational adiabatic algorithm where we actually will kind of start, try to design this trajectory and in particular this detuning ramp such that to stay adiabatic, uh, but we'll have some variational parameters. So for example, it will not necessarily be a linear ramp, you know, we can slow down, accelerate at a at, at, at certain point. And actually to really optimize this adiabatic trajectory, we actually use closed loop optimization. We basically have some, you know, parameterized trajectory, we evolve, we take a picture, you know, we see how good is, you know, how many uh, Rydberg atoms we kind of excited and then try to kind of change the trajectory to try to maximize this number. So basically, as a figures of merit, one could use two different things. One is approximation ratio, is uh, the number of mean independent set size which we measure divided by actual size of mass, or we can just look at probability to find uh, 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 MIS. So and then basically with this approach, what we have done is we actually explored, you know, hundreds of graphs with uh, ranging from, you know, some like 60 to about, you know, 300 qubits. Uh, we actually kind of, you know, we found a lot of kind of interesting universal features. So for example, the hardness of the problems is turns out to be um, controlled by uh, what's called, you know, the de solution degeneracy density. Uh, and actually even for the same size of the, uh, of the graph, you know, the probability to find MIS can vary by many orders of, of magnitude. But I'll just focus on one um, aspect of this uh, uh, work, and this is benchmarking against the classical algorithm. So basically, to uh, uh, do this benchmarking, we picked uh, a simulated annealing, which is actually general purpose uh, quantum uh, classical algorithm, which would be, uh, which sort of, you know, solves the problem regardless of the specific graph uh, structure. And in some way, this actually is similar to the approach which we are using. And um, because we excite atoms simultaneously, homogeneously. And so in the simulated annealing, the approach is to basically classically cool to the Hamiltonian ground state by just stochastically fl uh, flipping spins. And in this work, we optimize the simulated annealing, you know, with this collective updates to really get the best performance possible. And uh, this is, you know, an example of two different graphs, two different in instances. Uh, uh, where we, uh, uh, actually, sorry, four different instances where we compare our experimental results, which are these kind of uh, dots, uh, with the um, uh, simulated annealing, which just is given by the lines. And so what you see here, clearly there are two regimes. One is a regime which is at a kind of high energy, a relatively high temperature, where we basically, all of these lines are kind of parallel to each other. So basically, uh, uh, you know, there is comparable you know, depth that you need to apply, the circuit depth for both of these to get to a fixed approximation ratio. But then if you kind of now cool system to sufficiently low temperatures, you know, or go to sufficiently long depths, clearly something, you know, unusual emerges. So there are some uh, instances where classical algorithm really gets stuck and remains stuck for a long time here. 
So what is going on? Why are these instances special? So we understand it now. And we understand it as basically uh, being a result of instances which have a lot of, you know, pretty good solutions. For example, solutions with uh, uh, size MIS minus one, where you just have, you know, basically <clears throat> uh, the number of excited atoms or colored vertices, which is, uh, you know, MIS uh, minus one. Um, and uh, you have a small number of actual solutions. So basically what happens in this case is that the classical algorithm just undergoes this kind of random work on this on this hypergraph and basically there is nothing you can do so you can really just have, you know literally randomly explore all of this solution before you run into the solution which can lead to the uh, uh, actual you know you know most the, the optimized uh, 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 solution so basically you know in this case you can you know prove uh, that um, that the fundamental li limit to the simulated annealing is given by this hardness parameter is number of MIS minus one divided by number of edges leading to the MIS. And actually this parameter scales exponentially with the, uh, with the uh, system size. So let's now try to see how on these instances, on these really hard instances, the quantum algorithm performs. And what we find is actually is, you know, something which is a little bit puzzling. So on some of these instances, for example, the one which is shown on the gold, Basically, the quantum algorithm just really solves the problem. You know, it just, you know, doesn't notice this, this plateau at all and, you know, comes to the fairly high uh, probability to find the MIS. Um, but um, uh, on other instances, for example, blue instances, you know, both classical and hard and quantum algorithms, they kind of struggle. And so again, what we have done then, we generated, you know, a lot of different instances from these hardest graphs and then just try to look at the kind of performance basically at a certain depth, in this case depth for around 32. And uh, what you see is that there is actually a fair bit of kind of spread. So in many cases, the quantum algorithm outperforms the classical, but on some instances, quantum algorithm is even worse than classical. So what's going on? How can we understand what controls quantum hardness? Perhaps not surprisingly, what controls uh, and what we find is that quantum hardness is controlled by the minimum energy gap. So the way how we understand it, how we, how we figured it out, is we started working with smaller graphs where we actually can do a calculation where we can find where the gap closes. And then, you know, what we looked at, what our optimizer is doing, at what we find is actually our optimizer basically slows down uh, uh, at the point where the gap closes, you know, uh, and it's just, you know, we find it experimentally and it slows down to find the largest probability of solution just right at this point where the gap is minimum. And then what we can do is we can try to basically so look for this probability of MIS as a function of minimum gap, at least for the graphs where we can actually calculate this minimum gap. And what we find is that for the large number of graphs, you know, this, um, uh, uh, this dependence, you know, follows very nicely this kind of landau zinner scaling with actually kind of close to the optimal exponent. Uh, but, you know, there are other, there are some instances, the instance with which a very small uh, gap um, where, you know, this dependence is not followed anymore. And actually on these instances, it turns out that, you know, our total evolution time or, tower, or if you want total depth is actually not sufficient to really explore this gap. So this is basically here on these trajectories, we are kind of above the speed limit. So basically these trajectories correspond to like deep enough circuit to the uh, uh, high circuit depths. And so if we now take these instances and classify them by, you know, taking, uh, uh, you know, large circuit depths and small, small circuit depth, and if we focus on only this deep circuit regime, then, you know, we see clearly that, you know, um, we have a, 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 a overall speed up, which actually, uh, uh, super linear and actually nearly quadratic. You know, I'd like to emphasize that in this regime, uh, you know, this kind of probability of number of atoms taps, the circuit depth is actually a couple of thousand. So uh, the current efforts now involve trying to understand these experimental results. So for example, trying to understand if we can uh, have, you know, truly provable speed up for all unit these graphs. We're also exploring possibilities to have faster than quadratic speed up and also looking for uh, uh, possibilities for scaling up, understanding and controlling errors. 
So uh, this is some kind of sampling of the basically current theoretical work and theoretical understanding. So basically, you know, what we realized is that if you are really truly delocalized in the subspace of this, you know, you know, pretty good solutions, then this the constructive interference can really result at this quadratic enhancement. And actually, it turns out that you can add terms to the Hamiltonian, which which will guarantee this delocalization. And uh, uh, one can kind of see these terms are kind of like, you know, flip-flop kind of Laplacian, Laplacian uh, terms. And actually, you can see that under these conditions, you can basically see this quadratic speed up on all instances. But there are also possibilities. There are some instances, for example, here, which perform extremely well. And this is actually one of the kind of harder instances. And, you know, uh, if we go to sufficiently large circuit depth, we see that it actually lies above this Grover speed up line. So it turns out that these are the instances where you have some localization, but this localization is special. Here you are localized, you know, very close to the perfect solution. So basically this approximate solution uh, and, and, and actual solutions are localized close to each other. And this actually, uh, uh, we're looking at as an opportunity to maybe have, you know, uh, you know, faster than average uh, quantum speed. We also started to look uh, uh, at uh, problems which where we go beyond unit disk graphs. So this work is actually led by Hannes. Uh, and uh, the solution to encode graphs like this involves this idea of gadgets where you can basically add extra ancillary atoms which allow you to basically create, for example, you know, graphs uh, like this. And actually what's remarkable is that Using this approach, you can encode a wide variety of problems, not just maximum independent set, but other uh, hard optimization uh, problems. But also, for example, you can also encode integer factoring in this kind of network. Okay, so maybe I'll use five more minutes to talk about this kind of uh, um, other uh, approach. So what I have told you up to now is that basically, uh, uh, you know, the way how we run the experiment is we prepare the atoms uh, in a certain locations, you know, then, you know, start exciting them and looking at the coherent uh, evolution. Uh, uh, but can we change our uh, architecture connectivity during the evolution itself? It turns out the answer is yes. And the idea here is to then uh, to basically explore a different encoding, encode the information in the hyperfine states and only excite them into Rydberg states when you want to do quantum operation like a quantum gate. So the atoms in these hyperfine states can live for a long time and can be moved around while preserving quantum coherence. So here is an example. So we start with the pairs and we entangle them uh, by using uh, this uh, so-called living Pichler gate. You know, it actually was a very powerful uh, uh, recent addition, uh, theoretical idea. So, and um, uh, we entangle them and then, you know, after that, you know, we can either measure them directly or we can move them uh, around, move them away from each other and then uh, the basically uh, try to uh, again measure if the atoms are entangled and what you see is two curves on the top of each other. So basically entanglement and coherence is completely preserved while moving. And gives rise to, uh, this gives rise to this idea of this dynamical architecture where we basically can interlace the moves of atoms and the coherent manipulation. So here is one example. Uh, this is uh, the realization of the simple cluster states. So this can be done literally in two steps. So we start with atoms sitting near each other, excite them uh, into Rydberg states, do the quantum gate, entangle them, you know, and then move one atom to the next neighbor and then entangle them again. And then after that, we can just move one atom to some far away zone to do some independent rotations and so on. And so basically what we do is this case, we create this um, uh, cluster, 1D cluster state as verified by the stabilizers. So this is a very simple thing. Can we do something more? So it turns out the answer is yes. And actually, uh, uh, in particular, a class of states, which is actually, uh, you know, in particularly fascinating is the um, class of error correcting codes. So for example, steam codes, topological error correcting codes, you know, um, and, you know, some other uh, things which uh, one can do. So, uh, so we actually did this all now. So I will just focus on one example here. So let's consider the toric code uh, state. So toric code has been discussed yesterday. And let's ask the question if we can create a toric code state on a torus. So that kind of seems hard, right? Because we have two dimensional architecture. 
So, but uh, the way how toric chord works is, is actually just to remind you, it, it's composed from data qubits and these ancilla qubits, and basically these ancilla qubits are used to make, to measure uh, stabilizers. So, what we can do is we can actually unfold this torus, and in fact, this toric code state is equivalent, turns out, to the graph state with the non-local connectivity, where basically this ancilla, for example, is connected to these neighbors and to this neighbor here. So, we can implement uh, this uh, uh, graph state by using um, another idea, which actually also comes from Peter and Ignacio, uh, where about 20 years ago, they kind of suggested this approach where you can basically have a qubit, you know, one qubit, which is uh, movable. So it's kind of like at the time there was magnetic hard drive, so they were inspired by this magnetic hard drive. So it was, this was called quantum red hat approach. So we implemented this idea, uh, but not just using one, uh, 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 ancilla, but an ancilla array. So in this movie, for example, what you will see is basically the movie which kind of, you know, uh, makes the story called on a torus. And here we have eight ancillas which move around and now there is this big move, you know, and then finally you move to the out zone and, and, and read this out. So basically this kind of operation uh, creates the, uh, the toric code state on a torus and the way how we can uh, verify it is that, you know, we should be able to encode two logical qubits, one going this way around and one this way going this way around. And actually, indeed, if we measure this logical qubit operator, we find some non-zero value. But now, of course, in addition to that, we also have all of these syndromes. So we can actually, you know, try to correct them. And what you see is one of them corrects to one and another one, you know, not quite to one, but pretty, pretty uh, corrects pretty well. So basically, you know, we are actually quite excited about this, you know, because it really, uh, opens the door for many new opportunities for uh, kind of encoding and fault tolerant uh, processing. So, for example, we are looking at hypergraph codes, so DPC codes are within reach. We are also looking at um, hardware efficient method for error correction because we understand our errors quite well. We are also looking at measurement based approaches and also for hybrid approaches combining analog and digital evolution. So, I was planning to talk a little bit about this. Um, uh, hybrid approach, let me just kind of, you know, give you a little bit of sense, you know, and then I will conclude. So the idea here is the following. So suppose you have, you know, two uh, 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 systems where you can study, you know, some kind of dynamics, you know, for example, study quantum scars or something like this. And um, in this uh, 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 two copies of the system, you know, suppose that you would like to make a uh, measure of things like entanglement entropy. So one way of how you can do it, you can stop your analog dynamics and then bring these pairs of these atoms together and then basically just perform measurements, for example, in Bell uh, basis uh, of these two pairs. And actually this, it turns out that this way you can measure the expectation value of swap operator, which gives you purity and, and entropy. And this is a kind of stuff which we actually already started doing. And in fact, you know, where we can directly measure entanglement entropy uh, in, 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 in such uh, states. And um, this, for example, allowed us to measure um, uh, uh, entanglement entropy in this many body scars. So many people mentioned this. Um, uh, these are these very unusual trajectories, which sort of defy conventional uh, uh, thermalization. And this is something that we discovered, you know, very early on when we started playing with the still one dimensional atom arrays. And it turns out that they are connected to these ideas of chaos um, and so on. So this community knows this, this topic very, very well. So, but the prediction was that, you know, these uh, scars are special because entanglement entropy in these scars grows in some kind of very special non-monotonic way. So here is a measurement. So here is the measurement for the thermalizing state and here is for the for the scar state and actually, so you clearly see that one of them are base volume law, another one is by area law and, you know, moreover, one can now start looking at, you know, this, you know, scars and thermalizing uh, uh, states for different subsystems and you can clearly see, for example, here that for scars that there is non-monotonic entanglement entropy uh, uh, growth and in some senses scars were like the second law of thermodynamics. So this, I think, you know, uh, I've used up my time already. I hope I convinced you that it's actually a very exciting frontier. Um, and um, uh, I would like with that to thank you for your attention uh, and all of these people whose blood and sweat resulted uh, in this work. And I also have some special uh, announcement today. So it's actually tomorrow will be a very special day for some for very special purple person in our community. So 
Professor Peter Zoller, who has uh, inspired many successful developments in this area and, and many of the uh, 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 things which have been uh, talked about this conference. We'll have a very special anniversary birthday and uh, as a kind of very special present. So I would like to show something which actually is maybe the first publicly shown image from, you know, partially upgraded genera generation free machine. So, and this is, you know, uh, this, you know, happy birthday, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks, Misha. Any questions about the last slide? <laughs> Thank you. I had a quick question about yeah. the gates. So, yes. could you spend a minute explaining how the? Pardon me. Yeah. Okay. Could you spend a minute explaining how the Control Z gate works, and for the single qubit gates, can you address individual qubits? Yeah, that's that's right. so. Basically, the so there are two kind of important questions. So, the way how we actually. Uh, do control Z gate is we just excite simultaneously both atoms into the Rydberg state. And uh, the kind of key innovation of this Levin Pichler uh, was to kind to come up with a pulse sequence, which actually can, and, and so what you do, you excite them and then you de excite them. And the idea is that you basically have a phase shift, you know? And the key innovation of Hannes actually was, and, and uh, Harry Levin, was to basically design a pulse sequence, which does it in a kind of shortest possible amount of time, you know, kind of under these conditions. It's just a sequence of two pulses. So um, regarding your second question is that we can indeed address individual atoms, but what's most importantly, we can address groups of atoms. And that is actually very, very powerful. So for example, in this kind of, to make this movie, uh, you, you know, you address basically, you know, you know, two uh, groups. One is, is moving ancillas and one is stationary qubits. Uh, but actually to make this movie, to encode these two logical qubits, the number of control parameters you need is strictly two. And so in particular, as we think about scaling, this really, you know, I think for the first time provides a solution for the control problem if you want to control a large number of logical qubits, you know. Thank you. Hello. Oh. Um, I actually had a question about this movie. So it looks like in order to move all of the ancilla qubits out to the readout zone, you need to, your logical qubits need to be sort of um, filled more sparsely. So there's more distance between them. Does that affect your ability to do entangling gates and use the Rydberg blockade because they have to be so far apart? No. It doesn't? Okay. No. So I mean like, okay, I mean this here you can, you have an ability to move to spaces and then clearly you need to so, for example, one condition is, you know, the blockade, right, this red thing is a gate, right? So you would like these two atoms when you do the gate to be closed, but of course you can space the others, you know, to make sure that they are not interacting so that you can do it in parallel. And because this, this Rydberg interaction, when the wall goes as one to R, R to the six, this can be done to a very high degree of accuracy. So. I didn't really understand this non-monotonic entanglement thing you flashed at the end. I mean, yeah. maybe it went too fast, but were you preparing it in a superposition of scar states and then relying on some beating? Or? No, no, no. So what we did here is literally, so, uh, so as like just to explain to maybe remind the view. So the, 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 what the scar states are the following. So the scar states are the states in, for this model of this anti-ferromagnetic states. Right. And so when you quench them, you know, you have this kind of collapses everywhere. Right. So, what we've done in this specific uh, case, uh, sorry. so we have basically prepared this uh, state by hand, this RG, uh, RG, mm -hmm. right, and then did the quench. Right, and what, here, you know, we watched how the entanglement uh, grows. Mm -hmm. And what you see here is this is, this is half chain entanglement entropy. Mm -hmm. What you see, it grows much more slowly than for this thermalizing state. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. So, and um, and basically, you know, uh, so, and, and so here, uh, now what we look at, we look at entropy for different subsystems. Mm -hmm. And so in particular, so we look at this, you know, uh, so, you know, kind of every other atom, 
right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what you see here is that, you know, for gay for thermalizing state, it just, you know, when you quench, it just reaches some equilibrium value. Mm -hmm. But actually, what's kind of quite interesting, and it was kind of unexpected, you know, is that for, for these uh, scar states, mm -hmm. you see, you know, uh, basically, you see these, you know, blue and red subsystems, you know, behaving this in this kind of non-monotonic way. I guess the thing I'm confused about is if the scar was perfect and you initialized in the scar, there would be no dynamics. So where does the oscillation come from? No, but no, but so why? No, no. <laughs> so this is actually, so maybe that's the most surprising thing about this type of scars, right? right? Because, you know, if you perfect prepare in a perfect scar state, yeah. when you quench, you nevertheless, you start creating local entang entanglement, right? They, they, you, you basically start entangling this, this the entanglement starts to grow, and then system starts to disentangle. I think that's the most surprising thing about scars. Absolutely, there is a dynamics. Yeah, the, 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 you know, the, this, the, yeah, yeah, this, this, you know, this up-down state is a superposition of all of this manifold, right? Right. Can I ask a question? Maybe one more question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Like In the last part with the torque code, yeah. what are the ratios of your decoherence times to your gate times? Is that the so, concern? So, okay, so it depends on what, you know, you call the decoherence. So our memory is actually very, very good. Our memory, like in hyperfine states, uh, is basically, like now it's several seconds, you know, and we hope it will be kind of minutes very soon, you know. Uh, so we do not really need error correction to correct memory, but the kind of the main and our single qubit gate operations are also very good. So right now, uh, the uh, errors in single qubit operations are at a level of 10 to the minus four, and but we believe we have a clear path to something like 10 to the minus six. So the main error is two qubit operations, which is now at a percent level. And you know what we really need, what where we will need error correction is to correct errors during the gates. You know, and in order to make these things useful, we need to reduce this error, and this is something that we are working on. So we believe there is a straightforward path to reduce error by maybe an order of magnitude to 99.9, and then we will see the fidelity is 99.5. So that's a limitation. Thanks. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we should go to the. We can, we can ask actually the question from Julia. Okay. Um, yeah. So I. Um, so, so this movie you shown, where you can move the ancillas around. Um, I assume there is a time scale, like a. a you would want to move it slowly because you don't want to kill the coherence of the the qubits. Uh, but also, like you want to create a gate, right? So, so that means you have to control the time they couple very well. Like, there's some some time scale there, like. Uh, so basically, the the gate operations are actually very quick, you know. So the the gate operations, you know, in our case, it takes around 100 nanoseconds. So, and you know, this is a very, sh it's a very short time part of this. So, but of course, when we move the atoms, you know, we have to make sure that, for example, we don't lose the atoms. So there is a speed limit to it determined by a trap depth, you know, and, uh, you know, that's what kind of, what's what it's, it's limited for. So, and right now it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, it's kind of tens, you know, microseconds uh, scales, right? So that's all. Thank you, Misha, for filling.